Okay, let's talk about a very important concept called natural selection. And it's the idea that these traits are carried on from generation to generation to help a species survive and reproduce. And natural selection is a process that occurs in three ways. The first way is called stabilizing. And I think the best way to show this is by drawing graphs. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw a Y and an X axis. And along the Y axis, we're going to put population. And along the X axis, we'll put the trait. Stabilizing natural selection is where traits on extreme ends are somehow not helping a species to survive. So if we draw our bell curve like this, you have most of your population in the center. Let's say that um, our trait in this case is color of fur. Whoops. All right, and this is dark to light. All right, so most of your species is going to fall in the middle, and then you have your outliers, your extremes. Here you have extremely dark, and here you have extremely light. Stabilizing natural selection, the traits on the extreme ends are somehow not helping that species survive. So they're going to be the ones to die out. So what you're left with is a population that becomes more homogeneous all right, with the same trait. All right, with the same trait. Uh, another example, um, this example would be with the fur. Another example would be birth weight in humans. Okay, so a baby that's born too small, let's say, or those are going to be the ones that are going to be going to die out, or the babies that are born too large, all right, are also going to die out. So you get a more stable population. All right, and that should be pretty easy to understand. Let's take a look at the next type of natural selection and that's called directional all right we'll draw a quick graph population here's trait okay all right in directional for some reason half of that trait is now not beneficial for species so let's take, for example, the gray wolf versus the arctic fox. All right. So where it was once a benefit to be gray, let's say over here is white, there was some type of selective pressure. Let's say climate shifted and it got cold, and now it's better, it's more beneficial to be white. So you're going to have a shift from the gray to the white because now it's not beneficial for these gray wolves. I forget if I said gray wolf or gray fox. Let's say fox. It's not beneficial to be gray anymore, so you're going to have this directional shift into a trait where the arctic fox or the white foxes are now going to be uh, surviving and available for reproduction. So here, because of a selective pressure, In this case, a climate shift. You have a shift or a directional, directional natural selection to the white. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's move on to the third way that natural selection can occur, and this one is kind of interesting. It's called disruptive. This type is where the most common part of the trait becomes the negative and then will die out. So let's say there's a selective pressure which impacts the most common part of the trait and that's going to be the part that dies out. All right, so what happens is the population is going to be split into the two extremes. This usually happens because of a change in environment, a selective pressure. This is another one where selective pressure is the cause. All right, and what happens is it's going, to sl it's going to cause two distinct populations to form. And they're going to form from the extremes of that original population. So disruptive is a very interesting type of natural selection. All right, hopefully these all make sense. Let's look at them in a different graph. All right, here you go. 
these are the modes of selection. So let's say in this first one here, you're looking at the selective pressure fell on the sides, on this side here. For whatever reason, this part of the trait became useless for survival or reproduction. So you had a shift in the genetic makeup, and that's called directional selection. In this second example here, the selective pressure was put on both extremes. So those are going to be the sides that die out, and you're going to be left with a more stable population. All right, we call that stabilizing natural selection. And then this third one is your disruptive selection, where the selective pressure is put on the middle. So it's going to cause what's, what's the most common trait to die out and you're going to have two separate populations form. So hope that makes sense. Bring your questions to class if it does not. This is just a different way to look at it. Um, you can pause the, the video if you like to look at it, but instead of population, this takes into consideration the fitness in stabilizing the most fit species are going to be the ones with the most common part of the trait. Directional selection, the most fit are going to be off here to the left of whatever that trait is. And then in disruptive, the selective pressure, the least fit are going to be the most common trait. And you're going to have two separate populations. All right, so let's take a look at an example here. And a very famous example is the peppered moth in Europe during the Industrial Revolution. So what we have here is the peppered moth, and they call it the peppered moth because it's white and it has black specks. And the peppered moth developed an adaptation to look that way because it likes to sleep during the day, so it must be camouflaged very cleverly. And in Europe, the birch tree, which is white with black little spots on it, the birch tree is very common. So in order for the moth to survive, the survivors of the peppered moth looked this way. They looked white with black spots because then they could sleep during the day and hide from birds and survive. And that trait would be passed on uh, from generation to generation. During the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of pollution in the air. Uh, soot started to cover the birch trees and the birch trees actually turned black and birds were able to very easily see a white speckled moth sitting on a dark birch tree. So those were the ones that were eaten. The white stood out. If they were darker, they would be able to hide better. So it was the moths that had a genetic abnormality that were darker, like this one, that were able to survive. So you had a genetic shift, a directional shift, from the white to the dark and now the dark ones are able to survive during the Industrial Revolution. So there you go. There's natural selection at work. The funny thing is, once Europe cleaned itself up and the birch trees turned white again, now it was the dark ones that stuck out and the birds picked those off and you had to shift back to the white ones and those were the ones that were surviving again and were able to reproduce and the gene pool again shifted to the white peppered moth. So that's kind of interesting situation. Down the bottom right, you have a uh, example of a bird that is choosing the dark ones. And so now you're going to have a shift from the dark to the red. I like the peppered moth example a little bit better. Moving right along here, you're doing great. We're almost done. But we need to talk about one last really important concept speciation the creation of a new species and now we're talking about something different we're talking about macro evolution when you have the creation of a new species we're talking about macro evolution when you have changes within a species that's micro evolution so those are the differences there and we're going to talk here a couple minutes about macro evolution the creation of a new species so how does that happen here's a nice example with the fox population and right here you could see there was one common ancestor and something happened geographic isolation all right which leads to reproductive isolation all right so something happened it might be a climate shift it might be a flood it might be some type of disaster whatever it is there was geographic isolation and now you have two different species of fox in this case you have the arctic fox and the gray fox and those two foxes because they're geographically isolated are 
reproducing and surviving in two entirely different environments. All right, so they have two different sets of adaptations. They have two different uh, phenotypes and genotypes. And now you have the creation of a new fox, a new species. This type of speciation is called allopatric. Allopatric speciation. This is a type of speciation, the formation of a new species, where there's geographic and reproductive isolation. This is macroevolution. You go through all the processes of fitness and traits, but these two species, these, there are two different species, so they can no longer mate. All right, you have, you've created a new species. All right, this is evolution on a larger scale, where you create a new species or a new class of species. Okay, so here you go. This is another example. Um, you have geographic isolation, in this case a huge river. Geographic separated this some common ancestor. And this species over here found it most beneficial to survive with a horn. And they have adapted to an environment full of rainbows and flowers and happy little elves. Whereas the animal on this side, the adaptation to that environment, uh, the, the the ones that survived and reproduced were brown in color, had no horn. So now from a common ancestor, once this river geographically isolated these, the, this species, they actually evolved into two different species through macroevolution. Oh, here's one more example. You have an original field mouse population, okay, with some that are white and some that are brown. Again, you have a flood. They are now geographically isolated. And for whatever reason, it's not good for survival and reproduction to be white. So that mouse will die off. And then over time, you'll end up with a population that is different. All right, you have the brown species of mouse over here, the white species of mouse, and they become genetically distinct. Okay. And then I like this image because it says later, even if the river dries up, Let's say they're both reintroduced. They are no longer able to interbreed, making them two different species. Doing great. Here's the last concept for this portion of this lecture. And this is one of the more interesting types of speciation. This is called sympatric speciation. OK, sympatric speciation. All right, now this is the creation of a new species, but there's not, they're not geographically separated. This is a little bit different. All right, this is at the more genetic level. Most chromosomes, think about biology, think about your genetics class. Most chromo chromosomes are diploid. There's two, they come in pairs. But if you can add another chromosome and have three, we call it polyploidy. All right, multiple chromosomes. Polyploidy allows for an extra set of chromosomes. You can have up to as many as you want. All right, now in the human chromosome, an extra chromosome is a bad thing. But if we can do that with plants, you can genetically alter the plant and create a new species, species that cannot reproduce together. All right, so let's take an example here of the, the common wheat All right, and go through this. So the ancestor ha was a diploid. It had two chromosomes. But what we can do is we can add an extra chromosome and turn it into a different form of wheat. All right, so we can use this. And if you notice, there's more fruit on this. There's more seeds. All right, it's a bigger form of wheat. And you can actually take it the next step further and add multiple chromosomes. Let's say so you have, you've added six. And now you've created. What we, what we call now the common wheat, all right? And that's what we use to make bread. So we've taken native wheat and added chromosomes and made that plant a little bit better, all right? This is what we use to make pasta with. And then you add more chromosomes, and we have this new form of wheat, which we use to make bread, all right? So we do this every day in crops. We, use the, we do this for strawberries. We do this for bananas all over the place we do this sympatric speciation so we're adding chromosomes 
to create new species. And in plants, this is very beneficial in crops. So there you go. That concludes this portion of the biodiversity discussion. There's more concepts, don't worry. But I'll see you back here next time for a discussion on biodiversity and wildlife.